Good? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> you can put that on my, just, on, just put it in my seat. Oh, never mind. All right. We decided the last second uh, we will just combine today since there's not so many here. And uh, maybe it'll make things easier. If you will, take your Bibles. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And uh, as you're turning there, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the benefits of salvation. I don't know if this is a theme, if it's going to be ongoing, if it's going to be short. I, I just I let the Lord decide and let him dictate what needs to happen. But uh, there's benefits of being saved, amen? I mean, without a doubt, without a doubt, this world may tell you otherwise. Do you know what this world will tell you? You're wasting your time. And what I tell them is you're losing everything. <laughs> they, they have so much to risk. And, uh, but we have everything to gain. You know what? And those things that we gain, we don't even know of them yet. We may know about them. Or maybe we don't. There's so much that we have to gain we don't even understand or know yet. But I do know it's good. It's good. So Philippians chapter 3, <clears throat> before going there, um, you know, this is the first message of the new year. And, you know, we get excited about hearing that a new year. And make sure, it, you know, people get excited about that. But you know what, I bet you back in 19, excuse me, let's, let's rephrase that, 2020, they had a new year, 2020, didn't they not? And they were excited. It was the worst year I think I ever lived. And I, and I can say America, for sure, was one of the worst years it ever had to go through, especially in our time, in our lifetime. <laughs> 2020, it was a new year, and people were looking forward to that year, and we can honestly say it was not a good year. And you know what? In 2021, I don't think it was too much better. Mm -hmm. Now we're here in 2022. It's a new year, and yet this is what I do believe. We as Christians have everything to look forward to, no matter what the world's going through what the world is doing, because we still have Christ, and through Christ, we have so much to look forward to. We do. And we can't let this world and its failures be a distraction to us. We can't. We shouldn't do that. Um, so just because something is new doesn't make it better. And, you know, and, uh, I've had several chats with several people. And, uh, and you know, I have a, uh, a refrigerator that uh, I was kind of proud of. It was a Samsung. And that, you know, you remember when Samsung came out for refrigerators? I was like, wow, don't they just make TVs? <laughs> don't they just make this and that? And, you know, and they make refrigerators. And I was so happy to finally get a new refrigerator. It looks nice. But I'm going to tell you something. It is falling apart. <laughs> I replaced the ice box um, like a couple times. I replaced the doors on it, the little shelves on it. Uh, I, I still have shelves missing because it's falling apart. And I can honestly say, it may look nice, but it's not better. My, you know what I'm talking about? There's, and there's probably things in your mind you're thinking of like, you know what? He's right. There's things that just, they don't make like the way you used to. More sturdy, more stronger, more performance. And now we're getting to these days where things are cheap, built as cheap as possible. And I've seen products where when they first come out, they work great. But as time goes by, they make it cheaper and cheaper. And next thing you know, they're not worth anything. They don't last. And that's sad. So have you ever had, how about this? Have you ever gone through something where you can say, I had this that was old, but I got this that was new. And you can see the benefits in it. That does happen too. So it's kind of like the, op the opposite of the spectrum here. As seeing 
old things better than new things, but you know, there are newer things that are better than older things. There are. And we as Christians should fit in that category of knowing that, guess what? God allows us to represent him in this day and age, no matter how bad things are. And we should be thankful for that. How many people can say, hey, look, during my lifetime, I didn't have so much struggles to be a Christian. Blessed, I believe, are those that have tremendous turmoils in society and such, and yes, we get to serve him. Wow. Wow. We should keep that in mind. So there are some things I just want to share real quick with you that, that I find fascinating. Because, you know, there's some things that are new that are better than old. And things that are in my mind that are personal to me. And I'm just going to bring these couple up before we go into the passage. So many of you know that one of the things I did when I was younger is uh, I had a unicycle. And I remember when I started riding a unicycle, and this is the reason why. Because I've seen it on TV. I've seen it at the circus. And I'm like, you know, I've never seen that in real life. Yeah, I've never known anybody. I mean, where are they at? How come no one else has it? Is this impossible? Is, and you know what? It was a challenge. And I remember I asked my mom. I said, Mom, I said, she goes, what do you want for Christmas? I said, I want a unicycle. She's like, huh? <laughs> yeah. Christmas Day, years ago, I was about 10 or 12 years old on there. I get this box. It was a unicycle. She ordered it from Sears catalog. And it was this rinky dink. The wheel was about this big around, and it had a red seat on it. And uh, my dad came and picked me and my sister up to go to his house for Christmas. And I brought that thing with me. And by the time I was determined. I remember in his yard, he has this gazebo in his yard. And I got in that gazebo, and there's railings and everything. I'll tell you what. <laughs> You might as well be sitting on a broomstick with a, with a mop soaked in soapy, wet water on a sheet of ice. <laughs> That's the best way I can explain trying to stand up on this thing. It was hard. I'm like, this, this is crazy. And after several minutes, I'm like, you know what I did? I took that thing and I set it off to the side. I'm like, mm. It was hard. It was crazy. Now... Let me give you a little illustration here. How does one ride a unicycle? Here's my lucky staff. This is all you do. So for me to balance this staff, and you've done this before with brooms and such, but that's all you're doing. When I can sense that this is falling left, if I sense the top of this falling to my left, do I take this to my right? No. Because it would just make it fall left more. Or your right. So when it's up and it's falling left, I go left even more. Right? So you got to get back up underneath that center of uh, gravity. And that's what you do on a unicycle. The problem is a unicycle, when you're on that wheel, it goes back and forth. Right? So doing it this way is easy. But well, what if I start to fall left? My wheel's going this way. What you have to do is you gotta turn it like that. You gotta turn that wheel and get on it. And technically, that's what's happening. That's all you're doing. That's all you're doing on a unicycle. But you gotta do it with your legs and your body and your feet. So you're thinking, well, what's that got to do with anything? It doesn't. <laughs> I'll tell you what. It took me months, months, and I don't even know specifically. All I knew is I gave up several times. And I'll tell you why. Because I had no one to look upon and show me. Nobody that was there, I can say, yes, I know this works. I know this can happen. I know this can work. I know I can do it because it was set in front of me from somebody else. It was all on my own. And one day, I just kept trying. And I kept trying. And the next day, I kept trying. It was months later. I think it was even in the summertime. 
And then before I know it, I was doing it. I was doing it. I was like, wow. And guess what? I started a unicycle club. We had like six or seven of us that had unicycles. And one Christmas, further down the road, my dad gets me a giraffe unicycle. It's this tall. That was scary. But I can do it. It was exhilarating. So before that even happened, this is where it comes to the old versus the new. That unicycle I got from Sears, that wheel is this big. And there's pedals going to, it's not like a bike. A bike, you got a sprocket that goes to a smaller sprocket to a big wheel, which makes it go fast, right? Now, this thing has no sprocket on it. It's straight to the axle. And everywhere you go, you're, I mean, you're pedaling and pedaling and pedaling. I'll tell you what, it is exhausting. Very exhausting. And then my dad, or my mom, I can't remember at the time, for Christmas and my birthday, they got me the Schwinn 24 inch. That wheel's this big, brother. It's this big. Still straight to an axle, but that wheel's this big. I'll tell you what, I was riding in luxury. <laughs> I, I, I'm not joking. You go from one to the other, it is night and day. One, it's like this. It's like, like having a, a mini bike to a full bore motorcycle. It was so different. It was so smooth. It was less exerting. And look, I'll tell you what, you're like, you're just riding along steady. And your buddy's next to you and he's running. <laughs> it was so nice. It was so comfortable. I remember uh, years ago, me and my wife, my family, when, uh, you know, Ashley was after her, her being born, we lived in this apartment and we owned the Toyota Celica, 1977 Toyota Celica. That thing, when you drove down the road, it rattled. <laughs> the windows would rattle. The parts to it rattle. You would rattle so bad that it would blow a fuse, and my wife would have to go in and replace the fuse all the time. It was terrible. And yet, when we owned that car during the same time period, my, at the time, stepdad sold me his Lincoln Town car. How can you compare the two? <laughs> well, it was luxury, brother. Hey, this is, it was a white Lincoln Town car with a blue soft top. Gorgeous. It rode like a Lincoln Town car. It didn't rattle. It hardly made any noise. I remember coming on base one day after I got it, me and my two buddies in the Air Force, we come through the front gate, and you're supposed to have a sticker on your car that tells you you're legit. This is how they did it at the time. We come to the gate, no sticker, no nothing, and those gate guards will go, I mean, <laughs> and we're like, what? <laughs> and my buddy started laughing, and we just drove right through because they assumed I was some general or something because I had that Lincoln Town car. And I can honestly say, some things are better. <laughs> some things are better. Smooth, quiet comfortable, roomy. Yeah, things are better, Brother Tom. <laughs> things are better. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Well, we should already be there. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 9. It says, and now, just to let you know, Brother White was in this passage Wednesday night. And I already had this all laid out. <laughs> so how God worked this out. So uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 9 says, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You know what? Folks, I want to tell you something. You should mark this verse down. If you have anybody that thinks any otherwise contrary to knowing that faith and or works in comparison, go to this verse. He, may, he, he just puts this all out there. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Amen? Amen. Verse, verse 10. That I may know him, and the power of the resurrection, and the fellowship of the sufferings, 
being made conformable unto his death. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up a little bit and just talk about what these verses are really getting into. There, at this time, there was a lot of confusion. People were baptizing people in, in a different name. Or some of them didn't even believe there was a resurrection. Folks, if, if we can't know two things right now, that first of all, we're going to have, we're going to be changed. Amen? We are going to be changed. And the dead could rise through him. If we don't know that and believe that, what are we doing? We're not doing any good for anybody. Because that's what this world thinks right now, that, oh, there's no afterlife. Oh, no, by the way, if there is, it's going to be hunky-dory. Well, here's the thing. It depending on where you stand, depending on not you're relying on your righteousness or his, there's a big difference in outcome. Um, verse 20, let's go to verse, uh, Philippians 3, verse 20 says, For our conversation is uh, in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 21, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So there is a clue here that says that, first of all, the body that we have right now, it is vile. It is a vile body that we have. And, that, and now I'm just going to put this straight. This is talking about our physical body. This is not talking about how you act, what your conversation is. But that is part of it, but it is not inclusive to that. Okay, because here's the thing. Even though we have this vile body, it is corruptible. It is, can I say, falling apart. It is rattling. Amen? Doesn't mean we have to show that. Doesn't mean that we have to represent that. Because you know what? I am so looking forward to my new body. I have that to look forward to. And I tell you what, I, I find myself doing this all the time, and it's wrong. I allow my conversation to react knowing that I do have this body. I, 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 I think I give the wrong attitude many times because of this body. And I allow this body, this bio body, to take control. If I can just grasp a hold of this truth that, guess what? This body is not going to be here forever because I'm getting a new one. And not only a new one, but a better one that we don't even know of, that we don't even understand yet. In verse 21 again says, Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working where." By he is able to even to subdue all things to himself. So only through Christ in which this can happen, okay? Um, so during these passages here, we learn that, you know, it's, we're always looking to perfection in Christ. And we should leave behind those things that are trying to distract us and move ahead. And moving ahead, he's bringing this idea like, hey, things are going to get better. Things are going to get better. And he's given us something here that we can think upon and not allow, I'll tell you what, this world can have a lot of distractions and a lot of things to think about. But he gives us things to think about as well. You know, it's like, have you ever looked forward to something? It's encouraging. You have something to look forward to. Maybe you're going to take a trip to see family, whatever. You're looking so forward to it. And it kind of pushes you along. It kind of helps you through things, doesn't it? That's why he's doing this. He's saying, but hey, you're going to get a new body. Because this flesh that we have can have such a hold on us. I'll tell you what, my ankles hurt. <laughs> my feet hurt. I had surgery on both feet. I had surgery on this shoulder. 
and this one's going to probably be the next. But I can't allow that to distract me. And the more, now that I'm at a point, the more my body fails, the more I go, my new one's coming. <laughs> my new one's coming. And I think that's great. I think it's a benefit of having salvation. That one day we'll have a new body. And uh, so with this, the, this passage in here has a two-part meaning here. So, first of all, if you don't believe in the resurrection, don't baptize. And that's what's happening. People were baptizing people, but they didn't believe in the resurrection. And it's like, well, what are you doing? And Christ was talking, and Paul was saying, what are you doing? And also, they were baptizing in the name of someone that didn't rise from the dead. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? Hey, I baptize you in the name of Charles. <laughs> and uh, Charles died, but he's still in the ground. And, you know, what would be the point, right? That's just an example. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 39 says, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. My son asked the other day, Hey, Dad, do penguins taste like chicken? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. But if you think about it, we're different. We're the, and, and the reason why we're so different is because we do different things. We're designed differently to a degree. To a degree. And it's because we're different. But it just makes you wonder. I'm like, that's a good question. Do penguins taste like chicken? Because <laughs> most birds taste like birds, right? But I'll tell you right now, uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of um, deer, venison. For the most part, because it's gamey, I just, that's not my thing. Um, just give me a cow or chicken, I'll be good, or, or, or pig, or whatever. But uh, I'm used to that. Um, but flesh is different. And we need to understand that he's trying to, what he's tapping into is to know that there's a difference in things. And he's bringing this out. Uh, in verse 40, he says, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another huh now he's bringing this up he's saying by the way there's differences in our flesh and our bodies but he's saying but this is the biggest difference there's bodies celestial and bodies terrestrial what does that mean so terrestrial, does anybody have an idea what terrestrial means? Earthly. Yeah, it's earthly. It's of this earth. And for us to survive on this earth, we need this kind of body. Right? So if terrestrial, and you hear that terrain, terrain, you know, those kind of words and root words that describe earthly, now you have celestial. What does that mean? Heavenly. Heavenly. Hmm. I find that kind of interesting. Now, with that said, we all right now have a terrestrial body. We do not have a celestial body. That is to come. Because we have this terrestrial body, you know what? We are extremely limited extremely limited of what we can do, where we can go, period. So I like to think about things <laughs> and try to understand things. And one thing I do realize and understand is that for a man to go into outer space, his environment has to change, doesn't it? There's got to be things taken care of so this body that we have as a man, terrestrial, can exist. All right? 
whether we're in a space capsule, that capsule has got wood in it, oxygen, air, everything it needs for that person to live, including pressure. Because believe it or not, there is tremendous pressure of air, oxygen, fuel, I mean, wood, whatever we need. There's, there's so much to that. All those elements that are pressing upon your body, all right? Now, a lot of people don't know this, especially way back when. They don't, they don't think of that because they don't understand the, the physics and the science behind all that. But the higher you go, the more pressure you need. Because why? It's absent. <laughs> it diminishes. So when you go in an airplane and you fly 30,000 feet, that cabin that you're in is pressurized. And yet my ears still you know, swallow up and pressurize and you go deaf practically. You know what I'm saying? It, it's because of pressure. You need that pressure to survive and live better, to be more comfortable. But if you're on a space station or on the moon or whatever, you need a capsule that does that extremely well or a spacesuit. Now I got the thing. I was talking to my son the other day. He was asking me a lot of questions. And I like that because I like it when you think, you know, think about things. And I had to explain to him because he didn't understand something. I said, uh, the reason why you have a spacesuit because without it, you, you, your body would just blow up. There's no pressure there to hold it back and it's designed to be under pressure. So you ever took anything and you sucked all the air out of it, it blows up, right? <laughs> I said, here, that's why I have a spacesuit. They keep that atmosphere and that pressure in, uh, around your body to be considered normal for your body to live in. And the reason why we do that is because we are terrestrial. We belong in this space. We belong in this atmosphere. We belong to this earth. And that's how we survive. And when you take us out in a heavenly place, a celestial area of space, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot that has to be changed and, and taken care of. And then I tell my son, I said, well, if the spacesuit is there to make sure you have enough pressure, right? Why then do they go into these big, huge tanks, very deep, with spacesuits on? Because that's the opposite. That's where you go, hmm, Tom. Because when you're in water, it's, it's not a vacuum you're in. It's totally opposite. It's pressure on you. And I just said, just... I told my son, I said, just think about that. <laughs> makes, you, makes you wonder why. Now, I know they're trying to simulate weightlessness. Okay, I get that. But, <laughs> but still, at the same time, if I'm in a tank of water and I want to go from here to there, you know, I can just you know, <laughs> push myself because I have something to push against. In space, you do not. You do not have anything you'll push against because nothing exists. There's no oxygen, there's no air, there's no molecules, there's nothing. You can't just kick your feet and you're not going anywhere. <laughs> because you're a terrestrial in a celestial space. Wow. You're probably thinking, what does this got to do with anything? Hmm. I think it has a lot to do with everything. You know, uh, I was having a chat with my son-in-law, Kevin, the other day, and I was talking about this content here, and, and uh, we're excited about it, talking about having a new body and everything. And uh, because we're terrestrial, I, I believe this. I'm just going to put this out there. There are five senses we have because we're terrestrial. Let me ask you this, though. If we're celestial, do we have more? I think chances are yes. Because what we can't do is this, consider physics and all sorts of things in science, what is true at the same time knowing that we're terrestrial. We are so limited. And because we're so limited, you know what we do? We limit what can actually be real, what can be true, and what God is and what God isn't. Make sense? So... I have three dogs. One is really dumb, one is blind, and the other one barks a lot. <laughs> but the other day, it was like a couple weeks back, 
I was doing something and a dog was doing something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but something happened and it was so funny, Tom. <laughs> I just started laughing. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm like, why did my dog laugh? Because what happened was funny. It, certainly, it was simple and it was funny. And I'm like, and it caught me off guard. I'm thinking, you know, uh, my dog can't laugh. He doesn't know how to laugh. Yet the situation was funny. And yet, you know what? That dog is terrestrial. It's in the same environment, right? Same atmospheric conditions, same everything. And for it to live is in the same environment that I'm living. Yet a dog can't laugh. Keep that thought. If that is the case, what is it that once we have a celestial body, what exists for that celestial body that we can't even imagine right now in our terrestrial body? See what I'm getting at? You know, when I brought that up, I was talking to Brother Kevin, he goes, hearing color. Think I'm crazy? <laughs> yeah, Brother Tom, give me that look like, huh? <laughs> Who's to say that's true or not? We can't because we're so tied to this terrestrial understanding of things. But celestially, who's to say it can't be true? See what we're getting at? Look, there is so much for us to look forward to because we're going to be given a celestial body. And I'll guarantee a celestial body is better. Not only because it's no longer incorruptible. We can talk about that all day. But what other privileges do we have? Oh, let's take a look. Where do I leave off? All right, let's just start in verse 41 of 1 Corinthians 15. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star different from another star in glory. Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption, verse 43, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Verse 44, it is sown in natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. He's basically saying, hey, get a hold of this. Hey, things are going to be different. And I don't think that is only pertaining to living forever in heaven. There's so much more to that. But I, I'm so glad I'm going to get a spiritual body, a celestial body. All right, turn to uh, Mark chapter 9. I'm trying to hurry along because our time's running out. Mark chapter 9. We're going to get back to our subject in, in a minute. And Mark chapter 9, verse 2 says, And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them into a high mountain apart by themselves and he was transfigured before them. Verse 3. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. So in other words, this was so different, we had nothing on earth that compared to this. Okay, especially at that time. Nothing you can compare to that. In verse 4, And there appeared unto him Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And we all know this story, and we know this happening. And you know what I got to thinking? Why Elias and why Moses? Hmm. And I think this is partly the reason why. Well, we know Elias, which we heard in the Old Testament is Elijah. In, in uh, go to the Deuteronomy, verse 34. You don't have to turn there. It doesn't take too much time. Deuteronomy 34, verse 7 says, And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. So here's Moses had this reflection upon him. His face was shown, and we learned that in the Old Testament. 
he actually looked and felt and did things differently because how close he was with the Lord. He was special in that sense. I mean, if you think about Moses, you can think about a lot of things. But I tell you, there's one thing I always think about him when I think about Moses. He was physically different. He was that close to God that he was physically different. He is still terrestrial, but physically different. And Elijah, we know, that was taken up in a whirlwind. One saw death. The other did not. Yet they became different either way. That's pretty incredible. He gives you two examples of men. One never saw death and one did. And yet they were transformed. They were spiritual, celestial. And if that can't happen to them, what makes me think it can't happen to me? Make sense? Let me move along here. So in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a, a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and now Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So we see here clearly through the passage that God just took them. Who else did God take? Does anybody know? Anybody can think of one saying God just took? Enoch. Enoch. Man, I'll tell you what, that, that's a whole other lesson right there. <laughs> he walked with God, and God took him. But it's a shame that, it, you know, a lot of us don't believe this. And you say, well, oh, how, you sure? In John chapter 20. In John chapter 20. And verse 24 says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see the, in his hands the prints of the nails, and, and put my finger in, into the print of, his, uh, of, the, of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Yes, we do have doubt. And others have doubt. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within him, and Thomas with them, that came, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. So we see here that Thomas, first of all, doesn't believe. He doesn't believe that one can rise from the dead. Even God himself. And that should think, you know, what, what are we doing? If we can't believe that there's a resurrection, we can't believe that we're going to have a new body, and we can't believe what God is saying, the Lord Jesus Christ, what are we doing? We have so much to look forward to. It's wonderful. Um, verse 26, and after eight days, oh, verse 27, then say to uh, him, excuse me, he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. So two things here, doubting Thomas, and Christ knew what he was thinking and what he said, but we also see that he appeared in a place that was shut up, right? He was able to eat just like we can. Now, I was saying earlier that a terrestrial being is a very difficult task to be in a celestial place. A celestial being can be in a terrestrial place with no problem. It's better. It's better, amen? And he's showing you this right here. And, and Thomas answered and said on him, My Lord and my God. So now he believes. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, that thou hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Boy, that's pretty shameful. Now watch this. This is the exciting part of this whole thing. 
Verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Wow. I find it amazing that Jesus can come and go because he has new body, a celestial body that we're going to obtain one day, and he's not restricted by walls. Not to mention a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm excited about that. I mean, I'm excited just to have a body that doesn't have pain anymore or ailments. Never have a cold flu sickness, runny nose. I don't have to deal with that anymore. But guess what? There's a whole lot more coming. Yes, brother? Who knows? We probably build a hair color. <laughs> Who's to say we can't? I'm just giving you an idea. There is so much to look for us to look forward to in a celestial body. He walked on water. Can you imagine having a celestial body in water? You can't drown. Something to think about. <laughs> because the celestial can exist in the terrestrial, but is not restricted by it in any way. I am so looking forward to what God has. And I have to keep this in mind. Don't put the world behind you. Put your past behind you. And keep looking forward of those things that he will give to us simply because we have, know him and have salvation through him. Let's keep our focus and look forward to those blessings that he's going to provide. Let's pray. Lord, Father, thank you so much for this time. And Lord, I'm so thankful I have through you so much to look forward to. And I have so much to even think about. And I may not understand it all, but I know it's true. And I thank you that your word shows us that it is true. And it has been done. And already been done through others. And Lord, it can only be possible because of you. Thank you for this time. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.